I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, 9.50. We have got some great stories for you this morning. But first, a, fo a former Home Secretary, Swella Braverman, says that she is ashamed by the levels of anti-Semitism in Britain and the UK should not row back on its support for Israel. Yeah, and with the swastika row over the weekend, I'm sure you've uh, seen that video with the policeman, have we lost control of our streets? Do the Jewish community feel safe? We're joined now by Chairman of National Jewish Assembly, Gary Mons. Good morning, Gary. Do the Jewish people f feel safe in this country then? Let's get straight to it. I think many of them don't, quite frankly. I think the levels of anti-Semitism have risen catastrophically since the 7th of October. We've seen examples in hospitals, in schools, in universities, in businesses, of Jews being discriminated against. And worst of all, these marches that take place regularly every Saturday, which Suella Bradman would have banned if she'd had the opportunity to do, are helping to foment Jew hatred across the country. We had this incident over the weekend, Gary, on these protests that we're seeing every single weekend, uh, pro-Palestinian, and there was a, a conversation between a protester, a, a pro-Israel protester, we, we assume, and one of the police officers. We're just going to have a quick look at it to remind ourselves what happened. Would you like to walk with me? Because I can point these people out to you. And again, I was told when I asked that a swastika was not necessarily anti-Semitic or disruptive to public order. That doesn't seem right to me. Everything needs to be taken in context, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's a context of everything. Like, why, why does a con why does this swastika need context? So th this was the moment this Jewish lady complained about seeing placards of a swastika. She complained to a policeman who stood there swirling his coffee, swigging his coffee, and said, everything needs to be taken in context. What did he mean by that, do you think? I'm not sure he actually knew what he meant by it, but I think the context was a hate march. The context was hatred of Jews, hatred of Israel. And uh, if anyone thinks that the context could be different, then they're not watching properly. This is not the context of a Hindu wedding, because in the Hindu religion, this swastika can be used in a favourable manner, but not in this case whatsoever. Mm. What needs to be done is we should follow Germany in outlawing the use of a swastika completely and making it a criminal offence to do so in these circumstances. You see, I was quite reassured by hearing that police officer say that, Gary, because too often we leap to a conclusion and a symbol as you say can have different meanings in a very even that symbol in different contexts but was it therefore just that that police officer didn't quite understand the context of the march do you think i think that's quite possible the context of the march was blindingly obvious though to most of us um, and uh, there is of course i don't want to sort of pick on an individual police officer mm. but there is the issue of training and making sure that all police officers are fit for purpose in terms of doing their jobs. And this means education on certain basic issues, like what a swastika is, like the Holocaust, and like other instances of anti-Semitism. I'm wondering how well trained that particular police officer was, and indeed so many of his colleagues. I think you're being very generous there, saying he needs retraining. We've seen week upon week since October these marches, people singing from the river to the sea, carrying a placard saying, uh, Houthi rebels, turn those ships around. You know, you're being very, very generous there. And in actual fact, whether you agree with people like Tommy Robinson or not, he was pounced upon by scores and scores of officers for having breakfast in a cafe. Uh, and, uh, you know, it... Mm. <laughs> Make, make of that what you will, but it seems to be, as Suella Braverman is saying, there's one rule for one and one rule for another. And she said in her piece today that she'd actually ha have banned those marches if she wasn't sacked initially. I'm not being generous. We see these marches are blatant cases of Jew hatred. I am being generous to an individual officer because I don't think it's right to pick on an individual yeah. officer. Yeah. But... I would say okay. categorically there is no we're, doubt. We're running out of time, unfortunately, but very much appreciate you being with us. Uh, Scotland Yard have said the clip is a short excerpt from a 10-minute conversation. During the full conversation, the officer establishes that the woman the person was concerned about had already been arrested for a public order offence in relation to that placard. Don't go anywhere. We've still got a lot more to come. GB News.
brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather. We've got rain across Scotland through much of the day ahead. Elsewhere, some bright spells, some heavy showers in places, but it will feel warm, particularly in the south. So looking at the details, we can see this weather front stuck across Scotland through the day, giving outbreaks of rain, particularly across eastern parts. Elsewhere across the UK, it's a mixture of some bright or sunny spells, a scattering of showers, some of them heavy, but not quite as widespread as recent days, and some more Consistent rain coming into the southwest later. Temperatures getting into double figures, 15, 16 Celsius in the best of the sunshine, but still cold across Scotland here, 7 or 8 degrees. As we move through into this evening time, we see this area of rain slowly push its way northwards as the next area of low pressure starts to move in. During the early hours, we continue to see some outbreaks of rain across Scotland. For most by the end of the night, a mixed picture rain and cloud and temperatures generally 5 to 10 Celsius from north to south. So it's a wet picture with low pressure moving in from the southwest through Wednesday morning. This slowly pushes its way northeastward. So everywhere seeing various amounts of clouds, some outbreaks of rain, which could be heavy at times. But the clouds should break up behind it and we'll start to see some sunnier skies trying to move in from the southwest ahead of the next system. And temperatures again cold in the north up to around 15 in the south. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Sean Moore in Bedfordshire. The M1 southbound's got queues after an earlier breakdown at Junction 11 for Dunstable South. In Kent, the M20 coastbound's got speed restrictions between Junctions 8 and 9 because of Operation Brock. In Somerset, the M5 southbound, a vehicle having its tyre changed, is closed a lane from Junction 26 at Wellington to Junction 27. Lancashire, the M6 southbound, the exit slip road has a lane closed at Junction 29. That's because of a broken down vehicle. Manchester, the M60 clockwise has got queues. A lane's closed because of an accident from Junction 14 through to 13 for Worsley. And in Cheshire at Roncorn, the Central Expressway northbound's closed at the Bridgewater Expressway for emergency repairs. That's causing slow traffic. That's the latest. I'm Sean Moore. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. Fred chance to win a prize worth over £20,000. Text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
10 a.m. on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with me, Bev Turner, and Ben Leo in for Andrew Pearce. Very good morning to you. Now, Richie Sunak, he's thrown his support behind J.K. Rowling and her battle against Scotland's new hate crime law. She's challenged the police to arrest her. Union joke flag, another woke rebrand of the British flag. Team GB's Union Jack has turned pink and purple on a supporters flag for the Paris Olympics. Apparently, this is going to be a rebrand. What do you make of it? Oh, but it's diverse, Bev, don't you know? Uh, Hughes lefty salary, hefty salary, more like, <laughs> and lefty, some would argue. <laughs> Despite being taken off air last year, the BBC's Hugh Edwards is still expected to be the highest paid newsreader when the annual salary list is imminently revealed. And childcare rollout today. Parents are set to receive more support in the government's new funding package. Is it enough? The government says this will save parents nearly £7,000 a year. If you've got a two-year-old, you'll qualify for 15 hours free childcare from today. But will you be able to get a place? And some good news, shop price inflation eased to its lowest rate since December 2021. Is your weekly shop now becoming cheaper? Let us know. Lots of your emails coming in already this morning. Keep them coming, gbviews at gbnews.com. First, though, your very latest headlines with Sam Francis. Bev and Ben, thank you very much and good morning to you. It's just coming up to two minutes past ten. The headlines this hour. Aid workers from here in Britain and Australia are among seven people understood to have been killed in Gaza by what an NGO has described as an Israeli airstrike. The group were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the charity logo of World Central Kitchen and coordinated their movements with the Israeli Defence Forces. We understand others killed include Palestinians and people from the US and from Poland. Israel says it is now conducting a thorough review of that incident and the Foreign Office here in the UK also says it is aware of those reports. The Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, has confirmed the death of an Australian aid worker and said he expects to see full accountability for the deaths. We certainly have already contacted uh, the Israeli government directly. Uh, we are contacting the Israeli ambassador uh, to uh, ask uh, for uh, accountability here. Uh, the truth is that, that this is beyond, uh, beyond any reasonable circumstance that someone going about providing aid and humanitarian assistance uh, should lose their life. Here in the UK, the Prime Minister is backing J.K. Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. That law came into effect yesterday and outlaws hatred against people on certain grounds, including age, disability, sexuality and people who are transgender. But the author says the law risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak has backed those concerns. He says that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. Well, Shadow Minister Pat McFadden told GB News this morning that Labour has no plans to introduce any similar hate crime laws if it wins the next election. We want proper enforcement of the anti-hate crime laws that are there and make sure that the right penalties are in place to protect people. We're not planning to legislate for new crimes in this area and I don't think J.K. Rowling should be arrested. Meanwhile, Labour has launched a new campaign it calls the Cost of Chaos, aimed at exposing the government's economic policies in the lead-up to the next election. The campaign's website, which is now live, aims to show the cost of decisions made by the government, like scrapping part of the HS2 rail project. Sakia Starmer's party is claiming the government has spent more than £8 billion on what he calls wasted projects under Rishi Sunak's leadership. The government, though, says the website is a waste of time and they've called on Labour to devote more attention to setting out its own plans. Prices in the shops are rising at slower rates than for the last two years. That's according to new figures. In March, shop prices were up 1.3%, slowing from 2.5% the month before. The British Retail Consortium has said that discounts on popular Easter treats and essentials and promotions on electricals and clothing have helped to keep the prices down. 
Economic adviser Vicky Price told GB News that prices have actually been coming down for some time, but it's not been reflected on the shelves. Costs are still reasonably high for supermarkets. They had to pay a lot more in terms of wages, um, still some transport costs and so on. Uh, but overall, I think we could have expected by now to see prices falling rather than just inflation falling. And that is something which I think we need to be looking at for the future as well. The cost of a postage stamp is going up again from today as Royal Mail moves to address a drop in demand. A first-class stamp will set you back £1.35, that's a rise of 10 pence, and it's the same increase for second class, which now costs 85 pence. Twelve months ago, a first-class stamp cost just 95 pence. It's the fourth price rise in two years and comes after warnings that lower demand for postage is pushing up costs for Royal Mail. Adidas says that it will block any German football shirts featuring the number 44 amid concerns over a resemblance to the SS Nazi symbol. The new kits were launched last month ahead of Germany hosting the European Championship, but a historian flagged similarities with the logo for SS, which was a Nazi paramilitary organisation. The country's football association said it didn't spot the similarities when the design was approved, but it will now be changed. And finally, before we head back to Ben and Bev, TikTok is launching a new video feed dedicated to science, technology, engineering and maths for young people. The feature will collate some of the 15 million educational videos already on the platform from experts studying or working in those fields. Users under the age of 18 will have that new feed activated by default on their accounts. Content creators are hoping the feed will inspire younger users to consider careers in science and technology. But it comes amid concerns over the Chinese government's influence over the app's content, with the US moving to ban the app unless it's sold. Those are the headlines. More in the next half hour. You can, of course, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alert. Ten oh seven. You're with Ben Leo in for Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner on Britain's Newsroom. Uh, loving that TikTok story, by the way. Finally, yeah. kids getting some decent content like they do. Do you know they do they that in China? <laughs> so in, in China, TikTok is nothing like we have it in the West, where yeah. it's silly dancers and stuff. They have uh, educational content and you know. Uh, yes, they... science. Whether the kids will watch it or not, they'll just go back to videos of people with cats dancing around the garden. Right, Janice <laughs> has been in touch. Morning, Janice. Please, please leave our union flag as it is. We've lost our. St George's flag to the ridiculous colours for the English football team. This is, of course, this story. It's Olympic year this year. Olympics in Paris. Look at this. A purpley, pinky, messed up Union Jack flag. We're going to be talking to one man who carried the flag at the Olympics, a British hero, later on in the show, so don't go anywhere. Clement says, us English are already foreigners in our own country, and those people trying to change the flag are just proving that. And John says, as a Scot, my father and grandfather fought in world wars to fight for my freedoms. There's no way an unelected leader is going to dictate to me uh, and what I can say in a free country, referring, I think, to Hamza Youssef and the SNP's uh, hate speech. That's right. Bill. And Tina has said on the same issue, I've never heard such claptrap in all my life. I'm 78 and I will say what I like about who I like. The problem now, Tina, is if you said something in Scotland over the dinner table and somebody deemed that to have been stirring up hatred, they could anonymously report you to the police. And whether or not there was a victim of what you said, that could be pursued. I I I'm not even joking. That is what this looks like. Uh, Duncan said this is just another poorly thought out piece of legislation from the SNP government. They're not fit for purpose. And David says, I would say to Peter Tatchell, who we interviewed on this earlier, if you're not man enough to put up with the dark room idiots on social media spewing out their nastiness don't go on social media yeah just grow up that's what i mean when i said what does hate mean just grow up it's the stuff of 16 year old sixth form politics room discussions you can't stop hate it is a normal and actually it is a necessary human emotion we're meant to hate some things some days i hate the stories we talk about on this show some days i hate what is happening in the world and that's good because it will motivate me to change very different to hating an individual of course but very very different to enacting that hate in an act of physical violence against a person which should always be taken seriously here here right now
Thousands of parents are now able to access 15 free hours of childcare for their two-year-olds. That's right. The full rollout, rollout will be in place by September 2025, with 150,000 parents being able to benefit from it already. But is it enough? So we're going to ask that very question now to GB News political correspondent Catherine Forster. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Is it enough? And also, we were just discussing this off air. This won't apply if your partner who is at home doesn't work, will it? This is for working parents. Yeah. Um, is it enough? Well, I think it's worth saying that this is actually a really big deal. This is a huge expansion of free childcare. So from today, um, if you're working, if you've got a two-year-old, you'll be qualified for 15 hours of free childcare a week. From September, that goes down to babies from nine months and over. And by next September, all children nine months and older will qualify for 30 hours of free childcare right up until they start school. So the government's saying this is going to potentially save parents nearly £7,000 a year. So it is a big deal, but, but there's a lot of questions over whether people will qualify for this, but will they be able to get the places because the childcare sector is in crisis, they can't recruit the staff, their costs have gone up. They say that the money that the government is giving them uh, is nowhere near to covering their costs. So, in fact, uh, although the government are issuing codes, they think they're giving out like 150,000 codes, when you take your code to your local provider, you may find that they are full and they have no spaces, or they, you may find that you will have to top that up. So it sounds like a huge deal, and it is a huge deal, uh, but I think there's going to be quite a lot of problems. I'm with, with those MPs on this, including Miriam Cates, who've been arguing that what this legislation does is takes choice away from working parents. So surely for somebody you know you, you've got your yours are still little ben you're still dealing with this but mine are now grown up now when mine were little i shared a lot of the childcare with my mum um my childcare with my mum it was my children it well, wasn't childcare you know i was looking after my kids with my mother and with my husband's mother and often working parents want to do that i and this, for me, doesn't allow for that situation. I didn't want to plonk my son in a nursery for six hours a day. I wanted him to be at home with various people. Do we have any response from any other part of, of Labour or any other party how they would handle this? Well, the government are saying this is about giving a choice. Basically, they're saying that the cost of childcare was through the roof and what it did was shut many, particularly women, out of the workplace mm. altogether. So this is giving a choice. Um, of course, as you say, many parents want and sometimes are able to be at home with their children. I mean, Labour got into a bit of bother last week, basically saying, well, we're not going to commit to this completely. We need to see if it stacks up. The Tories are now using that as a... Labour are going to take £7,000 worth of childcare away from you mm. attack line. And there's votes in this, but the government are doing it because they want workers working, paying taxes, building the economy. Mm. As you rightly say, people like Miriam Kate saying, well, some parents want to take the time to stay at home with their children and they should have that choice too. The government could, for example, uh, transfer, you know, the personal allowance of £12,500 if they made it that you could, you could bunch those together and have mm. those. That would be a big benefit for, for mothers particularly yeah. want to stay what, at home, but I don't there, see that happening. Why are there yeah. such few nursery places? Because nurseries are some of the most lucrative businesses I've ever come across. Oh, yeah. The fees are extortionate, their overheads are a lot, but their, their profit margins are massive. And I know that for a fact. I know people who've worked in nurseries, manage nurseries. Why aren't they paying people, nursery carers, more money? Because they deserve more. I've always said it. If I'm paying someone to look after my kids, I want them to be paid top whack. I want the best people. Why aren't workers getting paid more? And why isn't the government doing more to make sure that nurseries are paying their workers more? Well, the government will say they've raised the national living wage as of now, won't they? But Certainly, it's one of these sectors, like people that work in social care, that, frankly, you can earn more money if you go and get a job in Lidl or another supermarket, you'll get more as an hourly rate. And, as you it's say, so wrong. it's a really, really difficult and demanding job. But although some of the bosses of these nurseries will be making a lot, the people that look after your children are not getting a lot of money. And, and the nurseries themselves are saying the government are simply shortchanging us, not giving us enough, mm. because, of course, their costs have gone up, like everybody's costs have gone up in the last couple of years. Mm. So, um, 
It's, it's difficult, but it's one thing announcing this. It sounds fabulous if, if you want to be working and you need to have that support, but um, I'm not convinced that there will be all these places that they've no. been promising. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine Thanks, Forster, Catherine. let us know if you are affected by this today. GBviews at gbnews.com is the email address. I just think it's such a stitch-up that if your partner doesn't work, then you're not entitled to it. Well, this is the thing. I think you should get a tax break because your wife has chosen to stay at home and look after for the children, you should well, they, be rewarded they, for making that They still that do go to nursery a couple of days a week just for right. the social aspects. Yeah. But, but it's, it, it's, it's the same with everything in this country. If you work hard and do things by the book, you get screwed yeah. for it. You don't Feels get rewarded like for it. it. Anyway, do you like the look of this new Union Jack flag? It's what supporters of Team GB are being asked to fly at the Paris Olympics this summer. Um, nice pinks and purples, certainly not your traditional Ridiculous. Union Jack. Uh, we'll have more of that after the break. Keep your views coming in. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. So many of you have been getting in touch over the WASPy issue. And actually, I just want to bring forward a view from Tony, uh, who has written in to say uh, something that we haven't included in this conversation well, so then. far. Tony says, it was well publicised, stop all the crying. His words. He says the Pensions <laughs> Act 1995 provided for this change. It was marginally sped up in 2010. But the fundamental issue, the WASPy issue didn't come about in 2010 or 2011. It came about in 1995. Yeah, people, people know that the, the legislation was earlier, but the problem was is a lot of women weren't told. Beverly, who's a WASPy woman, has written in saying, were the WASPy women living under a stone? I am one of the women who was affected by this change. My peers and I were fully aware of the changes. It was widely discussed on TV, radio and in newspapers as soon as the decision was made. We weren't happy at the time, but we recognised that it was fair. So it's wrong to spend billions in this way. I'd rather the post office people who suffered so much were reimbursed. Well, I think for the social contract to work mm. and for our society to be cohesive and harmonious, if that's possible, <laughs> you can't just have for people who, 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 who don't work or don't, or don't have much, have all the, receive all the, all the benefit. Well, now you're arguing against people. You're saying that people should have, in, to some extent, have looked in 1995 when the change happened. But, but fundamentally, it's not, just, it's not just WASPy women who've been screwed over since the financial crisis. We have a 70-year high tax burden. Someone earning uh, £60,000 this year will pay more tax than someone earning £60,000 has, uh, has ever had to pay before. Yeah, but Tom, Tom, you These do realise this isn't the first time that we've well. had hugely high uh, tax rates on income. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. It's 10.18. You're with Ben Leo in Foundry Pierce and Bev Turner on Britain's Newsroom. We're joined now by GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson and former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Colvier Ranger. Good morning Good to morning. you both. Well, we were chatting already in the break about the biggest story of the day. This is Scotland's Hate Crime and Public Order Act 2021, Colvier. They've been debating this since 21, and yet they've still come up with this piece of absolute nonsense <laughs> leading to a potentially tyrannic, tyrannical... Government in Scotland is awful. And, and leading to the world's best-selling author, I think, or one of them at least, yeah. J.K. Rowling, just making a mockery 
of the law by calling it out. Yeah. Uh, and she's not in the country at the moment. She's most of your viewers may have heard she's been tweeting saying, "Well." If this is the law, I'm going to say what I want to say and come and arrest me, literally taunting yeah. the Scottish police, who seem to be caught in the middle of this political quagmire of what's now a crime or not a crime. And in fact, how do they describe it? A non-crime hate incident. Incident. incident yes. A non-crime hate incident, Nigel Nelson. What wonderful world we live in. It is Kafka-esque this whole thing because <laughs> even if there is no victim here if somebody is observing a conversation they perceive that it could stir up hatred in the minds of a reasonable person that person could be arrested for words, Nigel. Well, yes, it, it, they could. That's absolutely right. And that, that um, I mean, we've seen this elsewhere uh, on a Palestinian march. If the wrong symbol is used, if the wrong um, the wrong thing is chanted, words actually are an arrestable offence. What J.K. Rowling has done. I'm not against her campaigning for um, single sex spaces for women. That's fine. I think that, that Carvey is absolutely right. She's taunting the police on the on these tweets, um, which I think is unnecessary. She's being unnecessarily offensive. Really? Yeah, on the basis that um, she's perfectly entitled to say that a biological man can't be a woman. That's fine, and that wouldn't be covered under this new law. To start attacking um, ten. Uh, well-known transgender women. I know the half, half of them are sex offenders <laughs> and paedophiles. Well, I mean... I Nigel. Just, we should just explain this to the audience if they're not on Twitter or X, as it's called now. In response to this act, J.K. Rowling issued a thread of tweets, there was about 10 or 11, in which she gave individual case studies of predominantly sex offenders who are trans people, yeah. men who have been found guilty of rape, who were then wanted to be in a women's prison. And she put all this, and it was very sarcastically written, and then she said, of course, these women... And then, at the end, she said, of course, they're not women, they're all men, come and arrest me if you think I'm wrong. But not just, just to do, explain do that. You know, do you know what that did? By her doing that, she said, right, Scottish police, either come and arrest me, and we'll have this out in court for the full farce that it is, on display for the whole world, or don't arrest me, and again, I'll expose what a farce this piece of legislation is. Either way, she has hit a bullseye and exposed the SNP, Hamza Yusuf, uh, Hamza Yusuf, sorry, slept the tongue, and, uh, and the uh, Scottish police for what they are pushing an absolutely tyrannical, farcical piece of legislation. Well, I mean, whether the, the, the leg legislation itself is farcical or tyrannical remains to be seen about how it's applied. Um, the point is that this bit of legislation is in place, that uh, J.K. Rowling is, is sailing quite close to the wind uh, with her tweets. And on the basis of that, it is up to, up to Police Scotland to decide whether or not they think an offence has been committed. Mm. The police don't want this law anyway. The last no. thing they wouldn't want to do is actually get involved in all this, but um, they've been lumbered with it. So if J.K. Rowling wants to be arrested and the police discover this is uh, against the current law, then that is what will happen. But I think, Nigel, the, the point here is that J.K. Rowling is not looking to be arrested. What she's doing is showing the law is an ass, and she's demonstrating it that despite the fact that they've taken years to try and come up with a sensible way of approaching this conversation, They've left it open and they haven't done what they should have done, which is protect people who need protecting, such as women. And we know we have a problem I don't with need that. protecting. No, no I do not need of, the protection. I know you were going to say that, but I didn't mean it in sort of we need to protect women. But what we need to do is ensure that when people are doing something that is damaging to other people, so attacking women and with in, violence, it, exactly, not words. That, that's where the law needs to be strong enough to demonstrate it can do what it does. Here, what we have is a world where people are now not allowed to say what they what they want to say. Mm. And I think that infringing on free, free speech is where the real no, no, problem is, occurs. The point is she is allowed to say what she wants to say. The, the, the issue here is whether she's allowed to, to attack individuals. No, well, it's about whether it could be seen to be stirring up hatred. That's the phraseology of the act. Yes, yeah, so, so, so there's nothing wrong with her opinion that she has, has, uh, she has the freedom to say, um, I believe a biological man cannot be a woman. That's fine. Um, that wouldn't contravene any 
any laws. When she starts misgendering um, uh, trans women, that's where she runs into danger. And the whole point of the law, the law is actually a bit, is a bit vague on this, so it would be interesting to have a test case in court to find out if it still works. Well, that's why I hope this, why I hope Police Scotland do arrest J.K. Rowling because she'd take them, she'd take it all to court, it would all play out, it would be the trial of the century and she would expose, as I keep saying, them and the SNP for the farce that it is. How do you stop hate? You can't stop it, people hating another person. Hate is a natural human emotion. Sometimes it's a good thing to have. I, I heard you say this earlier, Bevan, I, I agree with what you're saying. And it depends what kind of society... We're talking about what kind of society, what freedoms we want people to have. Look, I've grown up in an era where hate was racial. Of course. Where I was called the P word, I won't say it now, all the time growing up. Even though yeah. I'm not... Uh, I'm yeah. a Sikh, right? So yeah. I was misreligioned almost, mis, <laughs> mis uh, ancestry. All, all that stuff was thrown yeah. at you. That was hate. There was real hate between communities, between... We don't really have that. Now, if we have it, we call it out. Society has its own ways of calling these things out. Now, as soon as we start to get, try to get laws into saying what people can and cannot say to each other, I think we're edging into a very difficult world, especially where the police don't want to be wasting the time on this type of non-crime. Eager, but your boss, so Sunak has come out and he said, I defend J.K. Rowling's right because biological sex matters. I'm paraphrasing. He could have gone further. He should be going further. He should be criticising the SNP for this disgusting legislation. Why well, isn't he? Well, I, I think he's letting the SNP sort of uh, deal with its own problem that it's made. He's made it quite clear that he doesn't agree with what they're doing by supporting J.K. Rowling. He got so involved with the Gender Identity Act, though, didn't he? When, when, they tried, when the SNP tried to push through the Gender Identity Act, he got involved, didn't he? But unusually, a Western... Yes, he banned and he yeah, he's 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 it. Yeah. Why can't he do that now? I think he, you know, he's got to let them... There, there is devolution here, there is a Scottish Parliament, there's a mm. leader there Some wanting are more to important. make its own decisions. He's got to... He's, Humza Yusuf is making his own bed and he'll have to lay in it. Some things are more important. Uh, Nigel, free speech above all else we need to fight for. That but, is a hill I will die upon. But, but, but free speech is not unlimited. That's the point. It is, it should be. It's unconditional. Free no, speech should be, be unconditional. Well, then, then it's not free speech. Well, free, free speech has got to be... The, the right to free speech means it's got to be used responsibly. And so we put limits on the free speech... But who we... decides what's responsible? Who decides what's... Well, who decides who's offended? That's the thing. Well, initially, we do. I mean, there's no reason, reason to not offend somebody, but if that's unjustifiable offence, and that's in the GB News editorial charter, if, it, if it's um, uh, unjustifiable offence, we shouldn't do it. And we should, we should actually police ourselves on that. So we should respect individuals, respect other people's totally opinions. Agree. Um, that doesn't stop free speech, but it does mean you wield it in a way that is responsible, because that's the that's the the duty we have that goes behind the right. But of isn't there danger though if we are outsourcing every? internal, moral, ethical decision to the state. As individuals, we're losing the ability to do that self-policing, as you've just said. Well, it's, it's, say we take... We, we go back to, the, to the, the, the act in Scotland. I mean, what I'd imagine is most people will, will behave reasonably. I don't think mm. the police will be rushed off their feet. Um, I think people understand that they, they won't do it. But there are, there are some people, and this is where social media has come, and we all, we all get this. We all know that social media people say things there they wouldn't say to your face. Where people don't police themselves and that's where the law has to step but in. But that's ridiculous because I think it is just words, Nigel. And if you don't want to read the words on Twitter, don't go on Twitter. I think that you're right, no. Bev, that the, the issue of it being a non-crime, yeah. you know, what, what is it? And I know I understand what Nigel's saying about words matter and the influence on them and where they generate violence and hate, and that's where we have a line where we have to be clear about what we're saying. But if there's a non-crime definition, then why are we getting the police and the law involved? And that's the difficulty here, and I think we have to work through it. I just don't think that the Scottish Government has got to the right place yet. You remember, of course, this, as I said, I think it's so important that we discuss this, because do you know what was else was interesting? I was driving back yesterday from Chester, and like a lot of people, I spent about seven or eight hours in the car on a bank holiday Monday, listening to all the speech radio stations, and we were the only channel giving this issue the airtime that it deserved. Mm. Very few other speech radio stations were really getting into this issue because maybe across the media, Nigel, there isn't the same desire 
for freedom of expression. People are very happy with this kind of socially liberal virtue signalling, helping all morning. of this along. Yeah, it's on a lot, lot, lot of front pages this morning. I mean, the Mail has splashed it. Um, it's on the front of the Times. Um, big piece in the Telegraph. So Nothing I mean, they, in the Guardian. Uh, I haven't actually looked at the Guardian yeah, yet, funny. but what, what I do, I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> well, I can imagine that it won't be... You know, th th this is one of those issues where I think you can apply the old-fashioned right versus left perspective. Do you, Colvin? Yes, and I think we have to be very careful about the state having thought control, speech control, That's where exactly it's heading. It is. And, yeah. that, and there's a real worry for those on the right about when you start seeing, you know, authoritarian laws coming in about yeah. non-crimes. And Nigel, I think, sure, you'll be equally concerned about those kinds of things. And in fact, as we've all said, where we know we'll struggle to enforce this, and it'll become an arse. The law will become an arse. Yeah, but, I mean, we're doing it anyway. The Palestinian demonstrations have been an absolute example of, of where we've had to police words. So you, you have from the river to the sea where there is some dispute over whether that's always an anti-Semitic slogan. I don't think it always is, but it can be within context. We have, we have the situation um, of, the of the police officer who turned around to a Jewish woman and said, oh... Uh, a swastika depends on the context. Well, the context was in a demonstration uh, invol involving um, uh, uh, Israelis, and as a result of that, that context was then offensive, and I, I would say anti-Semitic, and therefore illegal. Yes, as was to the river to the sea. In every context it was used in those marches, no, because it's being used if, 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 as if, a way of describing something that people know. No, it depends on how, again. It depends on interpretation. But it's the context. It's the mark. Well, the context would be if if you were um, chanting from the river to the sea outside a synagogue or a Jewish school, the context of that would make it per se anti-Semitic. On a march, it can mean different things. From the river to the sea does not necessarily mean throwing all Jews in Israel into the sea. Gentlemen, I found this story about uh, the Scottish hate crime in The Guardian. It's made on page 11. You'll be pleased to know it's in there, <laughs> hidden in there, Nigel. Well, got there. <laughs> and actually, the way that it's written is that Yousaf is defending it and standing by it amid a barrage of criticism, is how they're describing it. Yes, and, quite and right. Do you, know, do you know what Yousaf has said? He said, those who uh, have nothing to hide, uh, <laughs> unless your behaviour is threatening, abusive or intends to stir up hatred, you have nothing to worry about. Naive. AKA, angry. keep your mouth shut and obey. Well, the, the, it's the equivalent of saying, if you don't care... You why do you care about privacy if you've got nothing to hide? Talking of keeping Same your mouth thing. shut, we've got to do that now uh, because uh, Sam Francis is waiting very patiently. Sorry, Thank Sam. you, gentlemen. They'll be back in a little <laughs> while. Here's Sam with the latest headlines. Bev and Ben, thank you very much and good morning from the GB Newsroom. It's just gone half ten and uh, the top story this hour, aid workers from Britain and Australia are understood to be among seven people killed in Gaza by what an NGO has described as an Israeli airstrike. The group were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the World Central Kitchen logo and coordinated their movements with the Israeli Defence Forces. Others killed include Palestinians and people from the US and Poland. The Foreign Office here in the UK says it is aware of reports of that incident. A spokesperson for the Israeli Defence Forces says it is being reviewed. The work of WCK is critical. They are the front lines of humanity. We will get to the bottom of this and we will share our findings transparently. The Prime Minister is backing J.K. Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. It came into force yesterday and bans hatred on certain grounds, including age, disability, sexuality and people who are transgender. But the author says the law risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak has backed those concerns. He says that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. And the cost of a postage stamp is going up by 10 pence from today as Royal Mail moves to address a drop in demand. It's the fourth price rise in just two years and comes after warnings that significant changes are needed to secure the future of Britain's postal service. Royal Mail says technological changes mean that demand is dropping while costs are going up. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts.
for stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a look at the markets this morning. The pound will buy you $1.2571 and 1.1706 euros. The price of gold is currently £1,800 and 39 pence per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,975 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. I'm just reading all about this Olympic flag being changed from red, white and blue. I'm incensed. But we're also going to be talking in a minute about uh, the fact that not a single car thief was caught in more than 100 <laughs> neighbourhoods Surprise. in England Broken and Wales. Britain. Why are the police struggling to tackle this issue? The CCTV footage on my street WhatsApp group every single morning of somebody nicking a car on our street. Why can't the police deal with it? This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Sean Moore. Starting off in Manchester, the M60 anti-clockwise has got queues and lanes closed because of an accident from Junction 13 at Worsley to 14 for the East Lancashire Road. In Lancashire, the M6 southbound, the exit slip road at Junction 29 is a lane closed because of a broken down vehicle. Into Gloucestershire, the A436 westbound hauling has been closed from the hauling turnoff to the Brockhampton turnoff following an accident. Elsewhere, if you're heading into Essex at Chelmsford, the A12 southbound's partially blocked because of a traffic problem between the Boreham Interchange and Junction 18. In Surrey, clockwise, the M25 has got long delays. A shed load has closed the lane at Junction 10 for the Wisley Interchange. It's causing queues back to Junction 9 for Leverhead and also diverting via Chessington and Oxshot. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. It's the first time we've had an admission from someone who at least used to be very senior yep. in the party, saying that this election is not about winning, really, for the Conservatives now, it's about mitigating the losses. There is broad recognition that this election has already been lost and that it's about damage limitation. And it is really important because it's the difference between whether, if, you know, if Labour win a slim majority, then the fight is on for the next election. I know it seems silly to look five years ahead, but it does make a difference, mm. versus basically accepting that we have 10 years of Labour government ahead. Having an acknowledgement that the Tories are going to lose and lose badly, mm. um, disastrously, maybe, um, having that acknowledgement coming from somebody so senior is very demoralising for everybody else in the party, but also doesn't it make it then look rather immoral for them to just drag on right through to maybe November? Personally, I think Rishi Sunak should name the date now. I think he should name it for October or November. In terms of reform, if they're only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, do we need to stop the narrative, which we have been using legitimately, saying, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing all right in the polls, but they won't win any seats? Do we need to change that perspective now? I think it's really difficult to say. It depends on reform's electoral strategy. There's a lot of evidence that in certain parts of the country with certain demographics, they do have a really good chance. So I think if they target seats in the red wall and other places where there's big disillusionment with the Conservatives and what they'd promised, I can't imagine that reform are at the stage where they could take uh, masses of seats. It's more about that portion of the vote that they'll be taking away that I think is going to result in that massive Labour landslide. Welcome back. And now, shock figures show that no car thief was caught in over 100 neighbourhoods in England and Wales <laughs> last year. About 85% of around 336,000 vehicle crimes were closed without the thief being identified. So why are the police asleep behind the wheel, or are they? Very good. Well, joining us now is the president of the UK branch of the International Association of Auto Theft Investigators, Mike Briggs. Good morning, Mike. I mean, I suppose if you'd asked any of us how much car crime gets solved, we would have thought there wasn't an awful lot. But this is just damning. It's effectively decriminalised. Uh, good morning. Yes, it's, um, there's a lot of issues around vehicle crime today. It's completely different to how it used to be in the 1990s. 
uh, vehicle crime methods uh, with the equipment available uh, means that there's not really a lot for police to work on um, and it's a changing face every day with the equipment that's actually being used. So are you talking about specifically the radio antennas which, for example, Range Rover and Land Rover have had problems with where thieves can unlock cars remotely from the comfort of their own car next to it, get into it and drive off? Well, that used to be the case with the uh, Range Rovers, but today Range Rover actually put in place uh, systems that will uh, actually not allow that. So the thief actually has to get on board the vehicle to to actually take the vehicle. So vehicle manufacturers have worked you know, consistently hard against uh, vehicle theft, and it's, it takes us all to know about vehicle theft and the methods being used. What are people doing with cars they're stealing these days, Mike? Where are they going? Well, <laughs> vehicles travel around the world, um, mostly without the, uh, the owners of those vehicles, uh, but they go on to either commit other crimes or mm. pay for other crimes, you know, drugs, uh, terrorism, human trafficking, things of that nature. And of course, you've then got the spare parts of the vehicle. So the vehicle will be broken up and then sold off in parts. And that's a global market. So are there any particular brands of car that are getting stolen more than others? I did mention, mention Land Rover and Range Rover, but you seem to think they solved that problem because, of course, there was that big story about the fact that insurance premiums for those vehicles had rocketed as a result of the issues they'd faced. Yeah, the, the, this is the problem with knowledge. Um, so everybody needs to, to have a bit of knowledge on vehicle crime from policing, the customer himself, um, the insurance industry. We've all got to play our part. Uh, so I think the number one vehicle being targeted at the moment was the Ford Fiesta. Hmm. You know, and you don't really hear much about that, but it's worth its weight in gold in parts. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a left-hand drive or a right-hand drive, there's a marketplace for these vehicles. We've never had so much personal, privately owned CCTV, Mike, on driveways. Is there ever any point you're taking that to your local police station, if you can find one? Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying on that. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's very important that you get as much information as possible, and CCTV footage really does help. Um, you you may get a conviction from that, but it is really difficult policing uh, because there is, there is no evidence of the theft. It's electronic theft, uh, so you've got nothing left on the spot unless somebody gets stopped on their way to or from the incidents because vehicle crime uh, is not performed by one person, it's a gang mm. and it will normally be certain individuals will normally do certain tasks from the driver to the person operating the equipment or the two people operating the equipment mm. depending on how it works. So, you know, it, it's, it's everybody's got to know what to look for. Yeah. Mike, are the car and vehicle GPS systems just redundant once they get nicked? Why can't we just trace the, their location? Uh, there are a lot of different tracking systems out there um, and some systems are really good. Uh, some systems use new types of technology. Uh, other systems, the older systems can be blocked or jammed uh, and the equipment is available on the internet to actually do this. So, you know, we need to tighten up on everything. Mike, let me read this to you. So this is the statement from the Home Office. They've said progress has been made in tackling vehicle related theft, which is down 18 per cent since 2010. We've also recently introduced provisions in the Criminal Justice Bill to ban electronic devices used in vehicle theft. Your response to that statement? Well, that bill actually is a big step forward and will help police no end, um, which then goes on to help the customer who's trying to hang on to his vehicle. So that actually gives policing a bit more knowledge and a bit more power over individuals carrying certain items because if, if I was to go and steal a car with the equipment available today you know, and I was stopped, I could simply say, well, this is for my computer at home. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this bill would actually go towards actually stopping me saying that because policing will be able to use additional powers over me to, to actually stop me to, you know, my tracks. 
OK. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. Fascinating. Mike Briggs there, the, um, from the International Association of Auto Theft Investigators. So Didn't I, know there was I, such a I want to know if it's, if it's lacklustre cops. Are they not doing their jobs or is it just easier for, for you know, car thieves? And organised car thieves. That's what it is. It's is not it just... Both? You know, when I was growing up, I'm older than you, Ben, but when I was... <laughs> you know, it might be a drunk guy walking home from the pub who might try the door and happen to just hotwire it and drive off, you know. But now, on our street, just a couple of nights ago, two motorbikes, two guys on each motorbike driving down at quarter past one in the morning, checking every single car, every car door, came across one of our neighbour's motorcycles. Um, I had got on one of those angle grinder things, shaved off the, the lock. My language and my vocabulary around car <laughs> theft is not great. Took off the lock and then... Sped away with it. But, but they, they do that kind of thing in, in broad daylight as well, don't they? Yeah. They don't care. Yeah, how many time, How many clips have you seen of people with angle grinders taking angle uh, bikes, grinders. motorcycles? Right, anyway, let us know your thoughts. If you've been affected by car theft, <laughs> gbviews at gbnews.com. Up next, though, a top former Olympian is going to give us his thoughts on this new Union Jack flag, and he carried the flag at the Olympics in Beijing. Don't go anywhere. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather. We've got rain across Scotland through much of the day ahead. Elsewhere, some bright spells, some heavy showers in places. But it will feel warm, particularly in the south. So looking at the details, we can see this weather front stuck across Scotland through the day, giving outbreaks of rain, particularly across eastern parts. Elsewhere across the UK, it's a mixture of some bright or sunny spells, a scattering of showers, some of them heavy, but not quite as widespread as recent days, and some more persistent rain coming into the southwest later. Temperatures getting into double figures, 15, 16 Celsius in the best of the sunshine, but still cold across Scotland here, 7 or 8 degrees. As we move through into this evening time, we see this area of rain slowly push its way northwards as the next area of low pressure starts to move in. During the early hours, we continue to see some outbreaks of rain across Scotland. For most by the end of the night, a mixed picture of rain and cloud and temperatures generally 5 to 10 Celsius from north to south. So it's a wet picture with low pressure moving in from the southwest through Wednesday morning. This slowly pushes its way northeastward. So everywhere seeing various amounts of clouds, some outbreaks of rain, which could be heavy at times. But the clouds should break up behind it and we'll start to see some sunnier skies trying to move in from the southwest ahead of the next system. And temperatures again cold in the north, up to around 15 in the south. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Another day, another woke rebrand of a flag. This time, Team GB's Union Jack has turned, surprise, surprise, pink and purple. At the moment, it seems to be that it's on the supporters' flag for the Paris Olympics. But, of course, we're yet to see the official kit. What is that going to look like? Well, one man who knows about the pride of carrying the Union Jack flag is Olympian 
Mark Foster. And we're looking now at the picture of Mark that was in 2008 at the Beijing Olympics. Uh, Mark joins us now. Mark, that was your fifth Olympic Games there when you were asked to carry the flag. That was an incredible achievement. How important is it to athletes when you pull on your kit, your Olympic kit for, kit for the first time, covered in Union Jack flags? Um, I, well, I think it's important. I mean, ultimately, one of these things is we all, we all think about the Union Jack and representing our country, and, it, and it, it looks the way it does, red, white, and blue. I always remember picking up every Olympic Games, you'd go to a sort of holding centre. It could have been the NEC or something, where 500 GB athletes turn up, and you pick up your your, your, your T-shirts, your track suits, your swimsuits, everything. And, uh, and it's one of those exciting moments that you're like, oh, what does the kit look like? Obviously, we're going to see soon what the kit looks like, and I'm not saying that that is going to be the Olympic flag there. I'm all for jazzing up a track suit, but I think the flag needs to remain the same. What did you make of the England football kit, Mark, with the Union, sorry, the St George's flag on the collar defaced? Um, well, first of all, I thought <laughs> there was a lot of fuss about such a little thing because it was only a tiny little, tiny little. St George's flag. But then again, I was like, well, if it's a tiny little thing, why doesn't it remain just the St George's flag? Um, there was a lot, in my mind, there was a lot of fuss about something so small. We're all play, they're all sort of playing under St George's flag still, and the St George's flag has remained the same. We've not changed mm. that. Um, because Joey Barcher made such a fuss about it, I was sort of, I was against him really, because I just yeah. don't like it. <laughs> this is the thing, it is so divisive, Mark, isn't it? When, when, these symbols are played around with. And we were thinking here, it is unfathomable that, say, the American flag, the star-spangled yeah. banner, if that was changed to uh, the red to pink, the blue to purple, there'd be such a, a patriotic sense of, sense of outrage, and yet we don't seem to have that. I, it, and why? It's, why, why is it? I was thinking this. I mean, it's not the athletes or the general public have, that have chosen to change the flag. It's obviously, I'm presuming Adidas, because they're the kit sponsor, and the British Olympic Association. Between the two of them, they've come up with something. Or is this just, as you say, the fans' flag? Well, if it is the fans' flag, they probably won't buy it. They'll just go and buy a load of Union Jacks and use <laughs> what they traditionally use anyway. Yeah. Well, it's been rebranded. Um, they've described it, the, the company that have rebranded it, have called it a diverse design system. And they've said they wanted to push the colours to their limits. So, obviously, red, white and blue, they say, is synonymous with Great Britain, but it is far from unique, they say, with nations such as France and USA. They're already sporting those colours, so we want to refresh it. And, and so we, they said, we decided to embrace the colours and push the iconic red, white and blue as far as we could. But they pushed the red to pink and they pushed the blue to purple, so that is just completely ridiculous. So is what you're saying here, it's a marketing thing? Yes. And also, is it one of these things that the fact that if brands do this, then we talk about it more so they get more coverage? I wouldn't have thought that was their motivation, though, surely, because they've also said, Team GB said, they've received very positive public feedback. That might all change after this morning. I hate to tell you, Team GB, because it is on, Mark, the front page of the Sun newspaper with the headline, Union Joke. So, clearly, a lot of people in this country do take this seriously, and it will have backfired on them. I, I mean, I mean, just the first time I've sort of, you sent me through this morning, it's the first time I've sort of seen the picture. That's why I put my glasses on as well, because I couldn't really see it very, very well. Um, it isn't, I think it, it's so jazzed up, though. If you look at the certain areas of it, it's not just changed the one colours or the three colours together. It's all the background bits as well. There's lots of swirls and other bits and pieces in it. And that's why I kind of go, they're not changing the Union Jack. The Union Jack's going to stay the same. That is just some artistic view of, I mean, where is that going to be present? It's not going to be present when athletes win medals. It's not going to be the flag that goes up, is it? That's not going to have changed. And I Mark, think athletes, when they're behind the, the track suits themselves, we don't know what they're going to look like. And I don't think that would have changed an awful lot. I mean, the Union Jack's still going to remain the Union Jack. You're not going to displace the Union Jack, I don't believe. Let's hope. Mark, some people argued that the England football kit and now this Team GB supporters flag has been redesigned in a nod to the LGBT community. What's your position on politics and sports? Should they ever mix? Um, 
I think sometimes they do mix. I think sports and politics do mix. But I, I mean, I, I think it shouldn't. I think sports is a place where it should just bring people together in a, I'm going to call sport a game. Because I, mm. you know, I, I got into swimming because of, all right, it's my love and my passion, but it was a game. My, you know, my job became a game racing against other people. And I think sport should remain that way. But then again, if you look at the, uh, not Invictus, well, the Invictus games, but I was thinking of the Rugby World Cup with, um, uh, in South Africa, that brought a nation together. So sport really does bring people together. So it, it shouldn't be shouldn't be used in a political way, but I think sometimes it, it is. And I yeah. don't think athletes should be a lot of the time. The athletes that go and represent the country at the Olympics will be doing that, and they'll be focused on that, and they and won't be, be focused on that. Yeah, they'll be focused on that, and they won't be making a fuss about whether the flag on their tracksuit is not the true British colours. No, but I, I, but I believe, and I haven't seen the Team GP kit, and it will be out soon, that it will have a normal yeah. union jack on it, and this jazzed up one will be the jazzed up one. Yeah, um, OK. Um, yeah. Well, they might, they might be quickly revising it if it wasn't, Mark. Great to see you, Mark Foster there, one of our greatest yeah. all-time Olympians, five Olympics as a swimmer. Up next, we're going to go over to Glasgow to see if anyone's been arrested for breaking the new hate crime laws. Don't go anywhere. GB News. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather. We've got rain across Scotland through much of the day ahead. Elsewhere, some bright spells, some heavy showers in places. But it will feel warm, particularly in the south. So looking at the details, we can see this weather front stuck across Scotland through the day, giving outbreaks of rain, particularly across eastern parts. Elsewhere across the UK, it's a mixture of some bright or sunny spells, a scattering of showers, some of them heavy, but not quite as widespread as recent days, and some more Consistent rain coming into the southwest later. Temperatures getting into double figures, 15, 16 Celsius in the best of the sunshine, but still cold across Scotland here, 7 or 8 degrees. As we move through into this evening time, we see this area of rain slowly push its way northwards as the next area of low pressure starts to move in. During the early hours, we continue to see some outbreaks of rain across Scotland. For most by the end of the night, a mixed picture rain and cloud and temperatures generally 5 to 10 Celsius from north to south. So it's a wet picture with low pressure moving in from the southwest through Wednesday morning. This slowly pushes its way northeastward. So everywhere seeing various amounts of cloud, some outbreaks of rain, which could be heavy at times. But the clouds should break up behind it and we'll start to see some sunnier skies trying to move in from the southwest ahead of the next system. And temperatures again cold in the north, up to around 15 in the south. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Camilla Tomini. This is GB News, Britain's election channel. Eleven o'clock on Tuesday, the second of April. This is Britain's newsroom on GB News with me, Bev Turner, and Ben Leo in for Andrew Pearce. Very good morning to you, Rishi Sunak. He's thrown his support behind J.K. Rowling and her battle against Scotland's new hate crime law. She's challenged the police to arrest her. I wonder if anyone has been arrested just yet. And Hugh's hefty salary, despite being taken off air last year, remember that, the BBC's Hugh Edwards is still expected to be the highest paid newsreader when the annual salary list is revealed. He makes a whopping £450,000 a year. Not bad for some. Union joke flag. Another woke rebrand of a flag. This time, Team GB's Union Jack has been turned pink and purple on a supporters flag for the Paris Olympics. The Olympian, Fatima Whitbread, joins us shortly. And Trump gag order. Donald Trump has been barred from criticising the daughter of the judge overseeing his criminal trial after labelling her a Trump hater. And childcare rollouts. Parents are set to receive more support in the government's new funding package. We want to know, is it enough? These plans could save families nearly £7,000 a year. Um, if you've got a two-year-old, you now qualify for 15 hours a week. But when you come to try and claim it, will there actually be a place? So I was <laughs> giggling during that menu about Trump. What, what is, what's happened? He's been banned from criticising the judge's daughter. For being calling... a, a Trump hater. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an SNP law, doesn't it? <laughs> Hateful rhetoric. <laughs> right, let us know your thoughts, GBviews, at gbnews.com. First, though, more on all of those stories with Sam Francis. Very good morning from the GB newsroom. It's just gone 11 o'clock and we start with the latest developments on the incident in Gaza. Lord David Cameron has now called for a full and transparent explanation from Israel after British and Australian aid workers were among seven people killed in an airstrike there. The group were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the charity logo of World Central Kitchen. The NGO has claimed that Israel's defence forces carried out the attack despite coordinating their movements with the military. Others killed include Palestinians and people from the US and Poland. The Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese confirmed the death of an Australian citizen and said he expects to see full accountability for the deaths. We certainly have already contacted uh, the Israeli government directly. Uh, we are contacting the Israeli ambassador uh, to uh, ask uh, for uh, accountability here. Uh, the truth is that, that this is beyond, uh, beyond any reasonable circumstance that someone going about 
providing aid and humanitarian assistance uh, should lose their life. The Foreign Office says that it is aware of those reports from Gaza and a spokesperson for the Israeli Defence Forces has given a statement in the last hour or so. He said it is reviewing the incident at the highest levels. The work of WCK is critical. They are the front lines of humanity. We will get to the bottom of this and we will share our findings transparently. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister is backing J.K. Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. It came into effect yesterday and outlaws hatred against people on certain grounds, including age, disability, sexuality and people who are transgender. But the author says that the law risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak has backed those concerns. He says that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. Shadow Minister Pat McFadden told GB News this morning that Labour has no plans to introduce any similar new hate crime laws if it wins the next election. We want proper enforcement of the anti-hate crime laws that are there and make sure that the right penalties are in place to protect people. We're not planning to legislate for new crimes in this area and I don't think J.K. Rowling should be arrested. In other news, Adidas says it will block any German football shirts that feature the number 44 amid concerns over a resemblance to the SS Nazi symbol. The new kits were launched last month ahead of Germany hosting the European Championships in June and July. But a historian flagged similarities with the logo for the SS, which is a Nazi paramilitary organisation. The country's football association says, though, it didn't spot the similarities when the design was approved, but it will now be changed. Prices in shops are rising at the slowest rate for two years. That's according to new figures out this morning. In March, shop prices were up 1.3%, slowing from 2.5% the month before. The British Retail Consortium says discounts on popular Easter treats and essentials and promotions on electricals and clothing have helped to keep the prices down. Economic advisor Vicky Price told GB News this morning that prices have actually been coming down for some time, but it's not been reflected on the shelves. Costs are still reasonably high for supermarkets. They had to pay a lot more in terms of wages, um, still some transport costs and so on. Uh, but overall, I think we could have expected by now to see prices falling rather than just inflation falling. And that is something which I think we need to be looking at for the future as well. And the cost of a postage stamp is going up from today as Royal Mail moves to address a drop in demand. A first-class stamp will set you back £1.35. That's a rise of 10 pence. And it's the same increase for second-class stamps, which now cost 85 pence. Twelve months ago, a first-class stamp cost just 95 pence. It's the fourth price rise in just two years and comes after warnings that lower demand for postage is pushing up costs for Royal Mail. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Good morning. It's 11.06. You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Bev Turner and Ben Leo in for Andrew Pearce. Very good morning to you. Now, Hugh Edwards, he's expected, remember him by the way, he's expected to be named as the BBC's highest earning newsreader almost a year on from the nude images scandal that took him off air. So, details of his six-figure salary are set to be published in this summer's annual report. This will come 12 months after he last appeared on screen. Yes, and a spokesman for the BBC said, as we've previously explained, we'll not provide a commentary on what is an internal employment process and we'd urge people not to indulge in speculation. Well, we're going to indulge in that speculation because it's <laughs> taxpayers' money and we don't mind doing so. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has said that people uh, should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. Uh, I think we're going to be talking about that in just a moment. That's not the same issue uh, as Hugh Edwards. But let's go now to Scotland with our uh, reporter Tony Maguire is in Glasgow. Good morning, Tony. We've been talking about this story all morning. This legislation came into effect yesterday on the 1st of April. One might have thought it was an April Fool. Day joke because it is 
so authoritarian in its ambition. The idea that you could be having a private conversation over Sunday lunch at home in the privacy of your own home and if somebody listening to that conversation deems it to be stirring up hatred against somebody of these protected characteristics, the police could knock on the door. I'm not exaggerating, am I? Has anyone been arrested yet? Good morning. Well, um, certainly Police Scotland had put out a notice last night to say that um, they are unable at this point to give a notice of how many people or how many reports have been made or how many people have been approached directly. Um, I would wager that probably no one has been arrested yet. Um, typically for legislation like this we see some kind of settling in an adjustment period um, and nobody more needs more adjustment than um, Police Scotland at the minute. Now they have been very vocal about their concerns for this. They're concerned that um, the nature of the bill will turn the public against them. They're concerned that their officers are already stretched to the limit and of course, this bill is already in place. So this, um, the new legislation began yesterday um, at midnight, and over yesterday we saw protests spring up at Holyrood. Hundreds of people arrived, all from different people. Now we had the family party, we had the Alba party, um, and indeed we had pastors representing their communities across Scotland. And all the while, um, people are still asking these questions, which you mentioned there. What can I say? What can I not say? What is a hate crime? What can I say in my own home? And certainly that is something that the Equality Network have tried to tap into. They put out a post yesterday that said that um, a hate crime really has to make somebody feel unsafe. So what we saw from J.K. Rowling yesterday um, in her Mammoth 11 post Twitter um, tweet or post, um, that will probably be OK as far as the, the, the legal quandary goes. All right, thank you, Tony. Uh, Tony Maguire there in Scotland. Right, we, we got a bit uh, confused there. We were talking about Hugh Edwards initially, and then we went to Scotland. But let's go back to Hugh Edwards, who, it's been revealed today, is still getting paid around 450k a year of licence fee payer cash, despite being suspended, pending investigation, over that nude images scandal with the, the young lad. Now, look, he's not been found guilty of anything. He remains a free man. There's no suggestion of any sort of criminal impropriety, let's say. But does he have an obligation, do you think, does he have a moral imperative to say, stop my salary, I'm not well enough to work? But he's not going to do that when he's paid 450 grand a year. So the, the problem is, let's just clarify, he won't and can't engage in the BBC's investigation because he says that the incident has sparked a bout of mental illness. So the BBC can't conclude their investigation. They can't sack him because if they sack someone who's mentally ill and something mm. goes wrong, I mean, they're in a world of trouble. So they're in a, a rock and a hard place. Yet, he's still getting paid 430 odd k a year and his contract runs until when, Bev? 2026. I don't know. It's very difficult because, of course, as you said, if they did dismiss him at this point, then he could absolutely do them for unfair dismissal because he's suffering a mental health crisis. And that could, of course, cost the BBC more of your money if that happens. But it clearly needs sorting quite well, quickly. The, the, the other debate there is should he be allowed to avoid an investigation citing mental health? Is that just an easy way out? How do we know he is actually suffering mental health problems? I mean, if you've been publicly humiliated in that way and that story's been re leaked as a married man that you were engaging in the exchange of photographs... Yeah, no, no doubt that. you'd be stressed out, but... Do you, do you know what <laughs> well, I mean? I, like, do, yeah. I, I think, I think, I think licence fee pairs have a right to know exactly what is going on with yeah. Hugh Edwards, and I think it's on Hugh Edwards and his lawyers and his mm. family and the BBC to try and be a bit more transparent. Let us know what you think at home. GBviews at gbnews.com. Theresa has got in touch about this Olympic flag. We're going to be uh, talking um, in a little while to another Olympic athlete. Uh, Theresa has said, this is horrible. How can the national flag be defaced and be allowed to get away with it? Everything that is British seems to be being undermined. Christmas, Easter and now now our national symbol. Oh, you missed all that, didn't you? The, the gesture eggs, did you get Oh, no, that? I saw oh, gesture it. eggs. That was on yeah. Thursday. Yeah, that was a heartwarming moment, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, Cathy says, I sincerely hope the flag is a joke. Why do we have to keep trying to muck around with England and Great Britain? Just stop this. And Stan has said, morning, Stan. Let's see how many athletes have that as a tattoo after the Games. We spoke earlier to Mark Foster, five-time Olympic swimmer. And Mark has the Olympic 
flag tattooed on his chest, actually, I think it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and, right. the, and, the, and the roses. A lot of Olympic athletes do have the Olympic flag as a tattoo. All the rings. They may not have the purpley, squirrely, pinky, bluey <laughs> one. Um, and, and Sarah says, just to provide some balance, no one had a problem with it in 2012 or 2016 or 2020. So why now so much fake outrage from the snowflakes? It's a good question, Sarah. I think because it feels like, and I, I don't like the feels, I prefer facts over feels, but I guess it feels like just another example of where the majority, I think, of the population are trying to hold on to and define a British identity, what that means unashamedly and embarrassingly to be British. And one of the, th one of the few things we have is our Union Jack flag. I mean, we do it beautifully here at GB News. Now, you might say this is a distortion, but this is <laughs> Medji branding, right? But we aren't stood on the podium at the Olympics. No, it's, st it's still got the colours. You've got the red, you've got the white and blue, purple and pink. pink. You know, is it a oh, nod? Right. Is it a nod to the LGBT community? Is it about diversity and pride? Well, the marketing companies say it is a diverse representation of the flag. What's that word, diverse? That's what gets my spidey senses tingling. Well, up next, Adidas says it is going to block any German football shirt featuring the number 44 amid concerns that it has a resemblance to the SS Nazi <laughs> symbol. Oh, come on. That's ridiculous, isn't it? If it, This is about context. If it's a mistake, it doesn't, isn't meant to in, uh, engender any harm or cause any upset. Is that really bad? Let us know. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Has the NHS killed your relative and then lied to you about it? There is an alleged cover-up culture in the NHS. They lie to you about why your loved one died, about poor care, then bury documents with evidence in them, and they try to silence staff who speak out. This is according to the NHS Ombudsman. There are around 11,000 avoidable deaths every year. 11,000! Someone's mum dies, their children know something dodgy happened, and then they're met with a rotten culture, including the altering of care plans, the disappearance of crucial documents, and complete denials. They lie to you, but they really get away with it because the NHS is like a religion, and people dare not criticise it. You'd be accused of NHSophobia. That annual budget is around £180 billion, and we now have about 2 million people working for the NHS. They cannot keep blaming everything, on being underfunded and understaffed. If they're covering up medical negligence, it means the problem doesn't get dealt with and it keeps happening. And that is the fault of the NHS managers, the people who run it. They've got the money for 837 non-clinical staff working at English hospitals on the highest paid band nine contracts, which is between 99,000 and 115,000 pounds a year. How many nurses would that pay for? How many junior doctors? And they've got the time on their hands to think about making the NHS the world's first carbon neutral health service. They've got time to consider whether women in labour should be picked up by an electric ambulance that might have to be recharged en route to the hospital. There are NHS managers with a budget of £180 billion, 2 million members of staff, and they're crying about being understaffed and under-resourced. If they spent more time looking after patients instead of finding ways to cover up avoidable deaths, then maybe we'd have a better health service. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
11.17 on Britain's newsroom. Ben Leo in for Andrew Pearce and I'm joined by the lovely Bev Turner who's back from her Easter break. Full of chocolate and a little bit too much Prosecco on a birthday weekend. <laughs> right, we're joined now by GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Kelvey, Lord Colvey Ranger in the studio. Right, gentlemen, should we start with this German football shirt story? Nigel, explain this to us. The German one. Well, yes. we, we have two controversies running, running side by side, but the German controversy is um, that Adidas has produced football shirts uh, with the number 44 on them. But unfortunately, the way it looks is the old um, Nazi SS symbol. Um, as a result, Adidas say, well, we didn't know what we were doing, but that wasn't the intention. But they've now stopped selling those shirts to uh, supporters. This is ridiculous. Um, and next year, Nike take over anyway. So it may be... It's, it's Adidas that made the Team GB, uh, or are making the Team GB kit, right? For, for the Olympics, yes, yeah. yes, they always which have, have which that. Which is the second controversy. <laughs> which is the second controversy. Uh, Colby, should common sense prevail at a time like this? Is it about intent, surely, with a symbol? Is it intended to look like the SS it, symbol? It does look like the SS mm. symbol, and there is a problem with that. But the real problem here is Adidas should be doing its due diligence on design before putting these things out there. If, and I've worked in industry where we look at design, production, imagery, all of that kind of stuff, because it really matters mm. what things look like. And it, when you look at this 44 symbol, it does look like an SS symbol. And I think there is a problem. So this isn't about people being overtly sensitive, because we know these things matter. Mm. They, can, they can drive certain people to start uh, becoming lightning rods for that kind of horrible undertone. So Adidas needs to do better, and it shouldn't just leave it to a last minute, oh, God, we've done this wrong. Mm. They should have... And it says something about what's going on, as Ben, you're saying, mm. even with the GB shirt issue, there seems to be something about Adidas's due diligence on design that isn't working at the moment. But there's no suggestion, is there, that this has been deliberate, Nigel? No, no, not at all. I mean, no, no, it, what they're saying is no-one realised. Uh, Do you the... think about how many stages of consideration my, something my like that would go somebody through? Somebody must have pointed to it and said, ooh, that looks a bit like an SS symbol. <laughs> But you know what? Idea. I bet there's a room of millennials who either don't know what an SS symbol is because they've got no understanding well, of history. I was about to say, Bev, because, you know, we see a lot of corporates juniorising. Yeah. You know, and there's a juniorisation thing going on, senior people maybe not so there, even the short, uh, short circuit in sort of how people go through authorisation on these things. We've seen it happen in a lot of mm -hmm. corporations. And that's how sometimes this kind of thing can get through. If you don't have a bit of grey hair or grey yeah, beard... Yeah, love a bit of grey the hair. <laughs> ...then sometimes these things... Yeah. Happen. I think in Germany you'd think that actually it would be... Because, I mean, there, there, yeah. there's such a fuss in Germany about, say, the swastika, which is banned. Mm. Um, you'd think in Germany they'd be really aware of something like this. And maybe somebody in the room does think that it is a problem, but they feel they can't say it well, because be of awful, people like you calling for more or a clamps down on free speech. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to see, see a clamp... <laughs> Out of free speech, but um, I'm not sure having an SS symbol is actually part of the free speech argument. But it's a that good is. point about people being confident enough yeah. to call out where they see things as being wrong. You know, you must have experience, you must have the culture that enables people to well, say, well, they're, they're, they're not. Think it's wrong. Look, look at the pandemic four years ago. Most people mm. thought a lot of the things going on during the pandemic and from governments was completely wrong, but they were too scared. They were too scared of losing their jobs and, you know, losing their status and losing mm. their friends to, to speak out. And, and we're not quite come out of the hangover of that, I think. People are scared. This, this, this phrase, you're not allowed to say that, really gained momentum, didn't it, during that period of time. Right, should we do some uh, cannabis chat? <laughs> shall we have a chat? You, shall we? Um, <laughs> should it be legalised, Nigel? It has been in Germany. Well, it's been decriminalised. Decriminalised, yes. sorry, it's yes. an important yes. distinction. Decriminalised. So, um, uh, amongst a number of other countries, Portugal, for instance, uh, now has decriminalised all drugs, so cocaine, heroin, and the result there has been quite, been quite promising, that um, heroin addiction went down from 100,000 to 25,000 wow. people. Um, HIV infection went down 90%. So there, there, there have been some positives and some negatives. Mm. There, there have been um, issues over drug addicts outside schools. So it's not been perfect there. Um, the answer is I think we should look at um, decriminalising. We're not controlling it as a... As a criminal justice matter, and really drugs should be a public health matter. Colby, why do the Tories think this is such a vote loser? Because, in actual fact, we're so far behind a lot of the Western world when it comes to cannabis. Well, I, I wouldn't say that, Ben. I don't think we're that far behind. And 
personally, I've always been of the, of the view that we shouldn't decriminalise drugs. I think mean, there is a war on drugs that people even, will even debate. Cannabis. Yeah, I, I think even cannabis, because from what I've seen, it opens the pathway to other drugs. And as soon as you go down that slippery slope, I know there are some advantages, as Nigel's highlighting, but Portugal, mixed view. Mm. Um, I've also seen the results in the US in certain states where decriminalisation of cannabis has happened. It, it isn't a panacea. It isn't the way that we think it will help us deal with this but scourge it, of society. Is it odd that alcohol is legal in this country and cannabis is not? But alcohol, yes, look, we, we can compare the two drugs. Alcohol is not taking you down the pathway to heroin... So, but but you know, the, the pathway to alcoholism. I uh, mean, yes, I, I agree. And but so it, the, we the wouldn't majority decide... of addicts in this country are alcoholics rather than, rather than drug addicts. Yeah. So it seems odd to have a law whereby you ban one soft drug and allow another. I think we can always have that debate. And society where it is, because alcohol is embedded in our society for hundreds of years and so on and so forth, and if we were going to do it again, we might not do it, although we did see prohibition not work in the US. I think we have to... And prohibition of cannabis hasn't worked in the UK. Well, prohibition hasn't worked in some of the US states as well. If do, you look do, at Colorado, do, if you look at California, if you look at some of the things that are happening in the cities there... Well, what, what's, your, what's your measure of working? Because Colorado have, have taken in untold amounts of tax money. The, the coffers are, are, you know, bursting at the seams with... with yes, uh, I went to Denver a few years years ago to, and had a look at what was going on there and the, the implications that there were for society for increased in homeless people more people ut utilizing recreational drugs where that was leading them as a society I think it's not the panacea it doesn't end in a place where we can say well this works let's mm. go this way so as you're saying we're not quite far behind the rest of the West world I think the jury's out of this what we do need to do is continue the crackdown continue the education for young people about the implications of these drugs. And I think by decriminalising, that doesn't set in the right it, tone isn't and message. Is the truth that the, the so-called war on drugs has spectacularly failed? Yes. Well, I think spectacular is, is there's a demand, there's a market, and therefore we continue to have to fight this thing. But it's the educational point. The damage, if we talk about the damage that alcohol does to people's, um, <laughs> to the health system, we have to talk about it in a similar way around drugs. I think that mm. has gone away for a bit. We need to bring that back. And we need to, for young people particularly, give them other things to do that aren't drugs. Yeah. Give them sports, give them job opportunities, give yes, them a, a reason yeah. not to want to get stoned at weekends. And young people are drinking less nowadays they than are. before, yeah. right? Because yeah. that's not because we've banned alcohol. Yeah. It's because the educational side of alcohol, the impact of it has worked. Mm. I think, you know, a similar way of handling drugs. Mm. Um, right, should we talk about this Union Jack flag being distorted for the Olympics, Nigel? It feels like a day of symbols, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it just, yeah. Um, I can't say I'm hugely bothered about it, but but my preference would be a proper Union Jack. I just think that if you're sending your national team out, um, they should go in the national colours. The national colour is the Union Jack, and that should stay unmolested, basically. I, I have to say, I am slightly bothered about it, because when we think about the Olympics or international events and we see the Union Jack, we and the rest of the world recognise that as Great Britain. If it doesn't look like the Union Jack, are we confusing ourselves and the rest of the world about who we are? Yeah, well, somebody from the website, the, the design website, that have come up with this, the, the statement is, as with many sports brands, colour was a point of contention. I don't think it normally is. You normally go with the colour of the club or the country, right? Obviously, red, white and blue is synonymous with Great Britain, but it's far from unique with nations such as France and USA also sporting the same colours. Again, this feels like the madness of a committee meeting where no one has put their hand yeah. up and gone, hang on a minute. The Union Jet doesn't look like the <laughs> I'd like to I think see, all know, we could all know the I'd difference I'd like to see what them. would happen in France if they messed around with the tricolour or in the US if yes. the Star Spangled if, you know, the flag was changed to such a degree that people couldn't recognise it. Yeah. I think there's something about artistic licence if you want to do something interesting on shirts, create a funny logo, etc., yeah. etc. Cetera, et cetera. But the flag itself needs to stay consistent, because that's who we are. Colby, is this on, on a deeper level? This wouldn't happen with any other country. We've already identified mm. that. Saudi Arabia, China, it just wouldn't happen. Is this a sign of what many people are calling a deliberate and gradual erasure of British society, British identity and culture? It's a good challenge, Ben. I hope not. I think we should have the debate. We should discuss it. But there are certain fundamentals that we need to retain and respect in our society, in our country. The flag should be one of them. Let's have the debate. 
but let's come back to then recognising why it's important, what it means to us, what it means to the rest of the world, and why it should remain the same. Because it really, it really feels like, Nigel, that this country is, is becoming a bit of a doormat in more ways than one. Mm. We've got water companies owned by foreign shareholders pumping filth into well, our I'd seas. I'd nationalise those so they were only... You've got, you've got uncontrolled mass legal migration, you've got a housing crisis, you've got tens of thousands of illegal migrants crossing the channel, nothing works, then they're desecrating our Christian traditions, then they're desecrating our flag. It all kind of feels, people are saying, this is a deliberate... You know, well, push to I mean, I'd, I'd love to let you answer, but Rishi Sunak has to speak, unfortunately. So, gentlemen, just stay right here. I'm sorry, Nigel. Some breaking news. Rishi Sunak has been speaking to reporters about his childcare provision. Let's hear what he had to say. It's a really positive week for the expansion of our childcare offer to support families, giving them the choice of how best to juggle childcare and their career. And we're moving towards a system where working parents will have 30 hours of free childcare from the time that maternity leave ends at nine months for their little one all the way to four years when they start school. This week it's being expanded to two year olds. That's really positive. I've been talking to families for whom that's going to make a big difference. We fully funded the programme and increase the rates that we're paying to nurseries, making sure that there are more childcare places available, more childcare staff available, and the future looks bright. And this is a really positive intervention, which, when it's fully rolled out, will be worth around £7,000 worth of support to working parents. And are these places guaranteed? Yes, these places. So that was Rishi Sunak this morning, um, being very excited about his childcare provision. But Culver, it doesn't offer choice to parents. All it's offering us is the choice, perhaps, to put your kid in nursery. Some people want to pay a childminder or a granny or a family member to look after their children. I, I think you're right, Bev. And I've got young children. I know the challenges mm. that are involved in this, the cost that's involved in this. But this is trying to help, getting those 100, 150,000 more places available. And I think it's also part of the broader fiscal challenge and benefit that this Prime Minister and Chancellor are trying to get in to the minds of the British public. This, the unpaid carers leave, the NI cut from, say, 10% to 8%, the, the triple lock on pensioners. I know we heard about fiscal drag. There's a lot that they are trying to do to show how they're helping a broad spectrum of society fiscally. And I think that's why the Prime Minister wants more time to get these things embedded. And they are things that are helping people and will help in their pockets. Plus, mm. let's not forget, he is dealing with that inflationary challenge. Mm. He is helping bring that down. OK. Um, but not enough childcare places, Nigel. That's the problem. Um, what you've got to do is, to make the system work, you've got, to, you've got to make sure the childcare places are there, that they've got the staff to look after them. Um, and that's been the problem. So you've got the money thing, which I welcome. Um, got the money thing going in. What you haven't got is the places to go with them. So it needs proper organisation. Mm. Save the Children, the charity, has been calling for a children's minister. Can you take that up I'm with the boss? There isn't one. Well, uh, you know, yeah, whenever there's a, a call for another minister, I think there's always a question of, OK, where is that role sitting at the moment? And I'd, uh, I'd expect it to sit across a number of different departments in terms of where those responsibilities are. We used are. to have one. We used to have a children's yeah. minister but, that used to, used to sit in the Department of Education. But then it's about whether it's in also the, the uh, DWP, because a lot of the Department for Welfare and, mm. and it, because a lot of the policies will come through there. So you start to get this minister that sort of cross cuts. Which just, I think let's focus on the policies. Let's we, get the right policies in place. Sam's waiting for us. But which government was that under? Who introduced the child care minister? Do you oh, remember? Tim children's was, minister. Tim, Tim Lawton. Well, not child care. Was children's Lawton, minister. You know, the, was children's minister when he was at the Department of Education. And who was PM? Uh, PM would be David Cameron then. OK. Thank you, Nigel. That's why you get paid the big bucks to be our political <laughs> know-it-all. Know <laughs> right, let's go to Sam, Sam Francis with the headlines. He's waiting for us. Bev and Ben, thank you very much and good morning from the GB Newsroom. It's just gone half past 11 and uh, I want to start with some breaking news that we're getting this morning out of Finland uh, where we understand a child aged just 12 has been taken into custody after a child of the same age, also 12, has been killed in a primary school shooting. Another three children, also 12, were wounded in that shooting at the primary school outside Helsinki. A police spokesperson has said that the victims have been taken to hospital while the building was cordoned off this morning. The Finnish Prime Minister has said that he is deeply shocked and saddened by the incident and that his thoughts are with the victims and their families. We will keep across that for you, of course, throughout the rest of the day. 
Lord David Cameron says that Israel must explain how seven aid workers, including a British citizen, were killed in an airstrike in Gaza. The group were travelling in two armoured cars marked with the World Central Kitchen logo. That charity, the NGO, has claimed that Israel's defence forces carried out the attack, despite coordinating their movements with the military. Speaking moments ago, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says there must be a transparent investigation. Shocked and saddened to hear the reported deaths of aid workers in Gaza. We're urgently working to confirm all the details, but my thoughts right now with their friends and family, they're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered, and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that, and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently, because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. And the Prime Minister is also backing J.K. Rowling after she criticised a new hate crime law in Scotland. It came into effect yesterday and outlaws hatred against people on certain grounds, including age, disability, sexuality and people who are transgender. But the author says the law risks silencing genuine debate on issues around gender and women's rights. Rishi Sunak has backed her concerns, saying that people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Up at noon, it is good afternoon, Britain. Emily and Tom are here to tell us what's coming up on the show today, guys. Got lots mm. coming up. Yeah, good morning. Questions. Lots coming up. Um, in The Guardian today, it's been reported that a letter has been signed by 60 organisations, including the Refugee Council, including law firms too, essentially calling on the government to introduce a Ukraine-style visa scheme for Palestinians trapped in Gaza. Now, there's quite a lot of detail on this. They're calling for visas so that people can perhaps reunite with family members in this country. Mm. And this is a question. So far, the government have refused such a thing. The First Minister and Humza Youssef wants such a scheme in Scotland. So we'll be debating whether that's a good idea. So, so are they calling for just the UK or other European countries? Well, just these the are UK. British organisations that are calling for Britain to step up in this area. And it's interesting because now that a Brit has been killed in Gaza, uh, as we learn in a, in, mm. in a strike in an aid convoy, this political pressure is mounting. And mm. the question is, is it the right thing to do? And do we have, frankly, the facilities to enable such? a scheme after, of course, oh, yeah. over 100,000 people taken from Ukraine, over 100,000 people taken from Hong Kong, tens of thousands of people from Afghanistan. The question is, at what points do we say, actually, on the humanitarian front, this country has mm. gone as far and as we can? Gaza, a terror hotspot. Would it be a national security risk to have such a visa scheme coming but into the UK anymore? at this but time? Who cares when we've got 40,000 boats coming across every year, people throwing their passports in the channel? But no one cares about national they want, they Let's want a special, Let's have them all in. They want a Get them all in. special visa, visa scheme, Ben, a special visa scheme for those right. But there's well. the other big question. Don't yeah. give up, Ben. Oh, <laughs> right. I, mean, <laughs> I think he's national... hit peak exasperation. <laughs> it's been quite the morning here, let me tell you. National <laughs> security. I mean, national security's gone out the window about four years ago. Oh, no, no, but, no, 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 you're no, right. There, there, I mean... There's actually quite a lot of security in this country now because we're going to police the most important thing of all, yeah. which is yeah. speech. And this gets us into our other big story that we're covering today today. Uh, will J.K. Rowling be sent to prison for a series of tweets mm. challenging the Scottish government and the Scottish police force to um, arrest her mm. for breaching this, this new hate crime uh, act, as it is now in Scotland? And a bigger question leading on from that, it wasn't just the SNP that put this act into force in the Scottish Parliament. It was voted for a couple of years ago. Not just by the SNP or the Scottish Greens, but the Scottish Lib Dems and the Scottish Labour Party as well. So questions. Will those parties, sister parties in the rest of the United Kingdom, pursue similar legislation at Westminster? Big do, do you get the feeling, Emily, she wants, J.K. Rowling wants a court trial? It will be the trial yeah. of the century. Let's have this out. Let's have this ideology out 
facts well, in court. I would love to see that, mm. uh, Ben. Of course, I do not want her to be arrested, but if she I were to she be, she it. would put up a very strong defence. She's the and perfect... I she'd provide her own defence. Yeah, She's the perfect yeah. person. Much. She's got the finance to do yep. it, and she understands words. If anybody's going to exactly. take them to court, it should be J.K. Rowling. Right, that all from midday. But still coming up, we're going to be talking to Fatima Whitbread about the Olympic British flag and inflation going down. Don't go anywhere. and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. This story caught my eye. Lloyds Bank, right? They own the insurance company Scottish Widows. They have now um, issued some kind of suggested guidance about which word to try and avoid, to try and avoid upsetting people or perhaps be as inclusive as possibly can be. One of these words is widows, which really caught my eye because of the amount of stupidity. If you own a brand literally called Scottish Widows, you can't then be saying that the word widows is triggering an offensive. Anyway, because it is so ludicrous, I need to move over from that part <laughs> because I want to talk about the broader issue. So yeah. many organisations, they have what they call ESG. I'm going to bring a graphic up on the screen uh, in case you're not familiar with what this is. But it's a sense of kind of government, and I would say it's almost like a spine. It underpins so much of what business does today. It stands for environmental, social and governance. And it's around things like um, how does a business perform when it comes to their environmental uh, impact? How diverse are their employees, how diverse is their board, and so on and so forth. Do you think ESG is a force for good and much needed within business or not, Ben? It is the introduction of systemic institutionalised prejudice in the United Kingdom, which is going to damage dreadfully our economy, but also our culture, our cohesion as a society, and it's undermining, again, coming back to it, the nation-state that is the United Kingdom. ESG has to be ditched. Mm, strong words, Judita. Do you agree with him? I don't agree because I think that with ESG, when you have them, what you're having an increase in is specialists in ESG being introduced into companies to, in, to kind of imbricate it into how the company functions. If you're moving in a direction of making your, com your company's functionality be optimised in a way that is inclusive of anyone from any background who has the qualifications to occupy that position, that is a good thing. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Gloria De Piero. This is GB News, Britain's election channel. It's 11.40, you're with Ben Leo in for Andrew Pearce from Britain's Newsroom and Bev Turner. Now, is the cost of living crisis finally easing? Inflation in shop prices has dropped to its lowest level since December 2021 as shoppers cut down on spending. Well, figures show that the drop was driven by falling food costs and competition between retailers, but how much does it affect the average British consumer? Liam Halligan is here to explain more for us. Is, is that right, Liam? Is it because we're, spend, we're spending less? I don't think we're spending less. What's happening is this seems to me unofficial numbers, British retail consortium numbers, this isn't Office for National Statistics or anything that provided by the government. This strikes me as the, may I say, the beginning of the end of the cost of living crisis. Of course, lots of people are still suffering. Prices are still going up. But prices during the year to March, preliminary numbers from the British Retail Consortium, prices during the year to March were up 1.3%, which is below the Bank of England's 2% inflation target. If these unofficial numbers then translate into official numbers, then we'll be looking at interest rate cuts soon. Let's just have that a quick look at 
Uh, and on the money graphic, it wouldn't be on the money without a graphic, would it? So in the year to March, shop prices came, uh, went up by just 1.3%. That's the lowest rate of inflation since the end of 2011. That's down from 2.5% the month before, 5.2% in February. The energy price cap, which comes in uh, at the beginning of this month, that's falling by 12% to £1,690 a year. It's another reason why, when the official inflation number comes out for March on the 17th of April, it's likely to be relatively low. And that's why I think we can now say from June, and that's when I think we're going to get the first interest rate cut from 5.25%. The money market is mm. now agreeing with that. It seems as if the stars are aligning for lower interest rates from June. Mm. There, there was talk we'd get something like four or five interest rate cuts from the Bank of England this year. Is that... I don't, think, I, I don't think four or five, Ben, but maybe two or three. That's certainly the Tories have been wanting that for a long time. That's their only real election strategy to the extent they have one, is to wait until there are two or three interest rate cuts by the end of this year. And also, hopefully, they can get another tax cut in as they see it uh, from September or October. Is... Um... Is, is it right, though, Liam, to say that it doesn't mean the prices in the shops are going to come down? They're just not going up as quick it as It means during the year to March, unofficially, prices went up by just 1.3%, which is uh, a very low rate of inflation. It's below the Bank of England's 2% target. I think any of us who've done a basket of shopping in the last year would say that just can't be true. So are supermarkets just taking advantage of the fact that we thought they were going higher? Well, so some price gouging going within on. within that one point three percent increase in prices, food prices over the last month have been, actually been coming down. Right, but we, you know, food price inflation got up to twenty yeah. percent this time last year. So food prices have clearly been at the centre of this cost of living crisis, mm. as have energy prices. You know, during this period, transport prices, in real terms, in some cases have come down. You know, some service sector industry costs have come down. But food and energy, the two real necessities of life, mm. they've been at the centre of this cost of living crisis. But there are now signs that food prices are easing and energy prices are easing too, not least with that off-gem energy price cap coming down from just the beginning of this week. But look, there's a long way to go and lots of households will still feel yeah. that they're struggling. OK, Liam, thank you thank so you. much. Uh, still to come. Fatima Whitbread is going to be with us, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about whether the Olympic flag, it's Olympic year, of course, should be red, white and blue. You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Welcome along to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. For many, it's a fine looking day out there today, dry and bright. Many of us seeing some pleasantly warm, sunny spells. But there is some rain in the southwest from this area of low pressure and across the far northeast, northeast of Scotland, under this weather front sink, persistent rain across Aberdeenshire, cold wind blowing across Shetland as well. The breeze picking up in the southwest as the rain creeps in across Devon, Cornwall, parts of Somerset, and just getting into South Wales by the end of the afternoon. One or two showers in southern Scotland, maybe northwest England, but for large parts of England, Wales, Northern Ireland, it's a fine, bright afternoon and quite warm in the sunny spells, 15, 16. Feeling cold, though, with that wet weather lingering across uh, the northeast of Scotland. That uh, rain persists through much of the night and further south, the rain will spread north. So most of us will see some wet weather through the course of the night, some heavier bursts likely in parts of North Wales, northwest England. It's going pretty soggy too across the east and south of Northern Ireland. Temperatures mostly holding up in the single figures, 9, 10 degrees the low in parts of the south. But it's a soggy start to Wednesday for Northern England, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Uh, Further rain and hill snow to come across the Grampians. Something a little drier in western Scotland and brighter conditions here. And it'll brighten up quite nicely too over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England. Some decent spells of sunshine through tomorrow afternoon, which could see temperatures getting up to 15, 16, maybe 17 Celsius. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 
think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. So another rebranding of a flag. Team GB's Union Jack has turned a little bit pink and a little bit purple. Yeah, and a supporters flag <laughs> uh, for the Paris Olympics this year. This is the design. Um, is it going to make the official kit, however? Uh, we're going to talk now to Olympic legend. She was also an I'm a Celebrity contestant from 2011, Fatima Whitbread. But also, Fatima, good morning. It's so lovely to see morning. you. Let's just reflect a bit on your amazing achievements, though, as an Olympian, because you were the first Brit to hold a world record in a throwing event. You were the first That's woman right. to throw more than 250 feet with your javelin. You've got an MBE and you've got this world record throw in 1986 European Athletics Championship. So, you have worn that kit with pride. What would pride. you say if they gave you a kit to wear that had a flag on it that was not <laughs> red, white or blue? I'd have to ask what's the meaning of the colours and, and why, because the Union Jack was adopted 223 years ago in, 19, in 1801, and the Union Jack is traditionally a symbol of uh, n the national pride and unity. I mean, let's let's look at it. I mean, mm. the, the George, the flag is made up of the following, uh, the George Cross of England, it's also made St Andrew's Cross of Scotland and St Patrick's Cross of Ireland. So this makes up the Union Jack, the United Kingdom. So I'm not sure why they want to change it because, let's face it, when you look at the colours as well, red is sim symbolises bravery, strength and valour. White represents peace and honesty and blue represents uh, vigilance, justice, loyalty and, and perseverance. Pres uh, yeah. Precedence. Does it say anything about what a really pink squiggle understand. represents, Fatima, does it? Not really. I mean, I, I was proud to, to stand on the uh, rostrum and, and see that Union Jack go up. And, uh, you know, I think it's uh, uh, really um, a question that everybody's got to ask themselves is what is the meaning of this change? Mm. Because it is the Union Jack has been there for 223 years. Why change it now? So, Fatima, just intuitively, what do you interpret the meaning of this change to be? Because a lot of people are saying it's a nod to maybe the LGBT community. Yes, I mean, look, the LGBT community is one thing. So, too, is if we want to get down to it, Fatima's UK campaign. No organisation or no ag uh, agency should be uh, bigger or more important than the Union Jack itself. I mean, it's red, white, and blue. It always has been. It's symbolic of what we nationalistic know of our country mm. and it embraces everything in a nationalistic framework. So why change it if that is the case? Well, well any organisation or agency the, it shouldn't be. Their logic, Fatima, from the design company said that red, white, and blue is obviously synonymous with Great Britain, but it's far from unique because France and America have the same colours. So they decided to refresh. Well, let them change it. <laughs> Don't change ours. I'm, 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 I'm absolutely disgusted mm. to think that they've done it, actually, without actually, you know, um, let's face it, it's been there. It represents our late queen. It represents, you know, the, the, everything that, that embraces what's good about our country, you know, as years have gone by, you know, and uh, I, f I feel strongly about that. I do think it's, uh, you know, no, no, no way sh should they have just gone ahead and changed the, the, the symbolic country's colours. It's national pride and unity. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned... Have you spoken to any of your, your fellow Olympians about this? And also, additionally, do you <laughs> get the feeling that 
our national identity is being eroded away in various eroded. aspects. As you see, as years go by, there's something else that comes up or crops up, uh, whether it be, you know, the, the LGBTQ or whether it be something else, you know, organisation or agencies. It's not about that. It's about our country. It's being proud to say we are Great Britain. And red, white and blue has been that since 20, 223 years ago, 1801. So why change it? Why is there a need to change it just because of other countries? We are what we are. We're not supposed to try and uh, mulch into something else, you know, in order to be individual. We are an individual country. We have red, white and blue in our colours, and that's the way it should stay. And I do please... wonder if yeah. it's... I do wonder, Fatima, if it's a slightly a generational issue as well, because... You know, once you get older, you feel you can assert your opinion in a situation. And a lot of athletes, particularly, are quite young. Aren't they? They're quite infantilised often by the sports, particularly now, probably more so than they were even in your day. I can't imagine them pulling on the tracksuit and feeling that they can say anything in the way that you would have done. No, of course not. And let's face it, our forefathers who went to war for us and fought for all the different things that we stand for now in, in a generation that we are, you know, um, uh, being before us, that shouldn't just be wiped out either. I mean, let's face it, at the end of the day, I'm proud to be British. The Union Jack is what it's all about for me, a national pride and unity, and it should be for those younger ones to be built on the history of what we, as a, as a nation, mm. are proud to be. Mm. And, and as I said... Get behind me, Academy's UK campaign for young children in the care system. I know you've spoken about it today. Brilliant. And uh, I'm, I'm doing every space camp all for May. That's f Get online, support me, fatmascampaign.com. Fantastic. We young will support you. And children and if you want to find that online, ladies and gentlemen, do Fatima Whitbread. So great to see Thanks, you. Fatima. Absolute British legend there. That is it from Britain's newsroom today. Oh, it's nice to finish on a high, isn't it? I feel a bit warm in my heart. I'm going to be on jubes for Michelle all this week, so I'll see you at six o'clock. Up next, Good Afternoon Britain with Tom and Emily. It's nice to see a warm ending to your show, perhaps a chilling start to ours. Is free speech under threat across the UK? Is JK Rowling under threat? Yes, and should Britain open its arms to Palestinian refugees trapped in Gaza? We'll give you the details after the weather. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Across some central southern parts, there will be a bit of sunshine tomorrow, but otherwise it's looking pretty wet and there's some rain to come tonight as well. That's because we have an area of low pressure to the southwest of us and that is driving a feature northwards as we go through the rest of today. So ending the day across parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England on a mostly dry note, but rain in the southwest will feed its way across much of England, Wales and into Northern Ireland overnight with some persistent rain continuing across eastern parts of Scotland, bringing a bit of hill snow over the higher ground here. Temperatures not dropping much for many of us because of the unsettled weather, although a touch of frost is possible across the far north of Scotland. Many areas then waking up tomorrow morning to a pretty wet start and staying wet across northern parts with some further, at times, heavy and persistent rain. Further south, though, a drier picture. Yes, there will be a few showers around, but we should also see some bright or sunny spells develop. In any sunshine, feeling pleasantly warm, highs of around 16 Celsius, but colder further north and feeling it in the wet and the windy weather here. Later on, as we go through tomorrow afternoon into the evening, a swathe of more persistent rain is going to affect parts of Devon, Cornwall and into South Wales as well. Looking ahead through the rest of the week and the unsettled picture does remain. In fact, it is likely to turn very windy by the end of the week, but temperatures rising could get to 20 Celsius by Saturday. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer 